I feel like um, for most people, once they restore 5 alpha reductase enzymes that have otherwise been, I guess, like suicidally inhibited by finasteride, they'll most people regain function pretty easily. But the ones that have like persistent side effects, those are the ones who would benefit from looking. Progesterone okay. is uh, the biggest effect of progesterone on psychology in the short term is that when you take progesterone, your brain immediately synthesizes more allopregnanolone, which is a molecule you talk mm. about a, a lot on your channel. This is something I feel like I should almost just the fact that I have you on would be a good tangent to go on about uh, post finasteride syndrome and or people on TRT that could otherwise benefit from exogenous progesterone supplementation. So I really like the idea of using progesterone to kind of like backfill that steroidogenesis cascade that may otherwise be deficient when you inhibit inhibit 5-AR. But then we were talking about how the negative feedback of progesterone could then be problematic in terms of even just normal androgen production, which then, you know, could result in its own set of side effects. So I feel like it's more, I feel like we agree on that. It probably makes more sense for people who are replacing their testosterone via exogenous means that it would be more of a um, thing to add in for those individuals and you were you said you were having success with individuals who are implementing that currently yeah I think for people who are not on TRT or you know they're not inhibiting their HPG system in some way in the future hopefully there'll be some kind of chemicals that target the rate limiting step in the synthesis of neurosteroids in the brain which is the TSPO receptor there are selective mm -hmm. ligands for it they just need to be produced they're not producing. That's what me and you got to get exactly. on. That's what I mean, yeah. yeah. But for people yeah. who are already on TRT, so when you go on TRT, you're the, a normal man's progesterone is mostly synthesized in their gonads. So when you go on TRT, you also stop the synthesis of progesterone, number one. So just to get to the normal level of progesterone, you'd either have to take HCG at a high, high dose or you'd have to take progesterone, which we estimated to be at about eight milligrams twice a day to replace the normal dose. But what's the value of progesterone? Other than the fact that it's anabolic and that it uh, enhances sex drive in the, in, the, in the pattern I'm about to describe now, it also causes relaxation. The main way this happens is progesterone's effect on psychology happens to be through. So when you take finasteride, you inhibit the conversion of testosterone into DHT, but you also inhibit the conversion of progesterone into allopregnanolone. And allopregnanolone is really important for um, anxiety and well-being and stuff like that. Uh, I found a paper that uh, Derek and I looked through in which you can see in these rodents it seems to be that giving them progesterone in inhibits some of the reduction that finasteride has on the synthesis of allopregnanolone because it's a direct precursor. So the idea yeah. is to give people progesterone so that their allopregnanolone levels don't decline that much because the main effect of post finasteride syndrome is the lack of sex drive as well as a lack of uh, well-being, a feeling of anxiety. Well, allopregnanolone modulates the GABA A receptors, and GABA is the main uh, neurotransmitter involved in anxiety and, and well being. And the other thing is, allopregnanolone is firmly involved in male sexual drive. Strongly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I feel like um, for most people, once they restore 5 alpha reductase enzymes that have otherwise been, I guess, like suicidally inhibited by finasteride, they'll, most people regain function pretty easily, but the ones that have like persistent, Side effects, those are the ones who would benefit from looking upstream at that steroidogenesis cascade up in the neurosteroid level. Cause it's not just, I made the mistake maybe like even as recent as maybe a year ago, year and a half ago, where I assumed it was just bioavailable androgen deficiency essentially relative to estrogens, you know, whatever else is happening. So, but I didn't realize how much the top part of the cascade actually mattered. And that some of these individuals are just like, chronically anxious even because they don't have enough of that um, neurosteroid cascade occurring. So this is the kind of stuff that I feel like it's just a matter of time before we kind of like make it more well understood the kind of like mechanism of what's actually going on because a lot of people are still on those like post finasteride syndrome boards and whatnot that are like, I don't know, they just think that they're screwed for life. And I think there is a way to intervene and restore that balance that otherwise if you were healthy before, you should be able to get back there, I would think. Well, also this idea that they're screwed for life is pretty crazy because if, yeah. if you have a change, so I reviewed the papers that regard post-finasteride syndrome, specifically I reviewed the papers that analyze 
uh, cerebrospinal fluid metrics, which is important because then you know what's going on in the central nervous system in terms of DHT and allopregnanol and all of that. There are changes in the post-finasteride people, but those changes can logically, deductively only be due to epigenetic changes. So if your epigenetics change because of a lifestyle change or pharmacology or something like that, if you change back that pharmacology, it will eventually reverse. You can't, yeah. you can't, you can't Some people just... think their like methylation is like permanently impaired. And I just don't see that to be the case personally. And in my experience with clients that have done consultations with me, it's, it seems to always be reversible. I haven't come across somebody who's had persistent 100% post finasteride syndrome forever that I've been able to speak with about this kind of stuff. Yeah, you so. can also make it easier for your body to reverse those epigenetic changes. For example, by, well, you don't have to go so extreme as to deal with the methylation, but for example, one of the epigenetic changes, uh, one of the ways epigenetic changes occurs is through histone deacetylation. So you can take like an HDAC inhibitor, which is a histone deacetylase inhibitor like for example sodium butyrate or sodium valproate which these things basically make the body make it harder for the body to adapt to its uh, epi uh, environment basically in terms of in uh -huh. genetically but yeah so nobody's going to be impaired for life from that i don't i don't think that's likely yeah it doesn't seem to be my experience either when i've spoken with individuals that have because it's they think it's some people think oh it's a fear-mongering thing about not taking finasteride but it definitely does happen i'm not some people want to make kind of this illusion that there's no such thing as side effects and then there's people who think it's the worst thing ever but the reality is definitely somewhere in the middle where the likelihood you're going to get side effects is low like for example you're on finasteride right now and you're presumably just fine and you 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 don't even use it for hair loss you use it for for other stuff so and that's you know pretty rare for somebody to take it just for prostate health well at least in our community i guess it is um but yeah i think it is always i think it's an overly hyped up thing in terms of uh not realizing that it is in fact reversible, so. Well, also there's an important thing that people should realize, like it is very, I mean, post finasteride syndrome is a real uh, serious danger because think of it this way, when women get pregnant and they have postpartum depression after giving birth, it's been, it's been made clear through a, like the last 15 years of research that that postpartum depression is due to a decline in allopregnanolone subsequent to giving birth. The reason why the, this, the, hormones change so much is that during pregnancy, see women's progesterone levels peak once a month and then they really peak during pregnancy. And when they peak during pregnancy, women also obviously consequently have much more allopregnanolone than they usually do. So during pregnancy, women have this glow, which comes from being comfortable, confident, relaxed, happy. And after giving birth, this allopregnanolone shoots down, they get postpartum depression. Well, it's really severe. I mean, all of us have heard of some lady who had postpartum depression that really affected her life. Currently in the US, the only FDA approved medication for postpartum depression is actually allopregnanolone. Uh, injected- Is that like a sin? I thought it was like a, oh, it's actually bioidentical? Yes, the actual oh, okay. allopregnanolone bioidentical hormone injected IV for a couple of days after giving birth is the only medication used to treat it. How much does that cost? Oh, I don't know quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's covered <laughs> yeah. by insurance. I, I remember hearing it was some like exorbitant amount, but I don't recall what the number was exactly. Yeah, unfortunately, the, the, the medications I'm interested in right now that are very expensive are the PCSK9 inhibitor and the Bempidoic yeah. acid, which I sent you a link to also. I don't know if you checked out Bempidoic acid. No, I saw your email. I have to check that out still. 